Ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Dr. Meisel, dear Dr. Faber, dear Ms. Schutti, lieber Max Kotbauer, lieber Bernd, dear Professor Forgo in, I think, room, seminar room two, dear colleagues, dear students of this fantastic summer university of the Vienna University. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening, and it's an honor, because I'm teaching at the University of Vienna Law Faculty only since summer last year, and I did it only online. So thanks for inviting me to this beautiful place, to this wonderful summer university with so many talents from all around the world. Uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to you in person, no? because uh, the Vienna University so far is for me screens on an iPad, and I'm so grateful to see you all in person. It's the first lecture since two years that I give in person, so I'm very grateful to see you all. We only do it half an hour, because otherwise we will not be able to bear it, huh? because uh, we are, uh, otherwise we would be, again, switched back to the screen. So thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, you have here two and a half days of debate and reflection, those who are participating in the summer discourse, about the pandemic in all its multidisciplinary elements. Huh? You speak about culture and economy, politics and law, even the arts uh, and artificial intelligence will get their place. I think this is a great idea to do this. Huh? It was a great idea 14 years ago and it is even a better idea today after the pandemic when we have learned all to truly appreciate, to discuss and reflect together. And you even have organized in a way that the weather will not distract you too much from uh, your reflections and discussions in the next days. So I think the scene is set. Huh? I was asked to set the scene uh, with some reflections from a European Union perspective about the European Union after this pandemic that we have been through over the last 18 months. Huh? And I have to say, I will speak to you as an academic, not as a representative of the European Commission, because we are here in an academic setting, and therefore my views may not necessarily always reflect uh, the official views of the Commission. I'm also in the midst between my work and my holidays, because tomorrow is my first day of holidays, so I'm particularly grateful that my wife and I, on the way to Passau, which is our university town and our home in Germany, that we are able to see you tonight and discuss with you about some lessons for the European Union after this pandemic, and I hope we can really say after this pandemic, because this is also the first informal lesson. We never know for sure where we are exactly in this pandemic. I, I want to share with you five personal lessons that I would draw from the experiences the European Union has made over the past 18 months with this terrible pandemic. And I would like to recall, because we always say pandemic, and this is such an abstract term, this pandemic has killed in the world 4.5 million people. Here in the European Union, 750,000, and alone in Austria, more than 10,000. So this is not an abstract academic subject. It has touched each and every one of us deeply. Uh, I think many of us were scared at some point, uh, uh, and uh, some of us even had uh, losses or even diseases in their closer friends and families. Uh, therefore, this is not an abstract subject. Lesson number one that I would like to share with you, it's again my personal lesson. I think this pandemic has shown that human relations, political relations, and also the relationship that is called the European Union is much more fragile than we often think. It's nothing is self-evident. That is something that this pandemic has taught us, certainly in the first weeks of the pandemic. Just think back to the first weeks of the pandemic, how we all behaved as human beings, normally, faced with a danger, not an abstract danger, a real danger, a danger, a disease that is carried from human being to human being. How have we all reacted? The first reaction was withdrawal. Let's all be honest, huh? Withdrawal into our four walls with our families. We were worried about our closest, notably about the older in our family. Uh, so let's also be honest. The first weeks of the pandemic didn't bring out the best of all human beings. Can we say that diplomatically in this way? Uh, there was a lot of egoism at the beginning. Uh, you remember people piling up toilet paper as if this was the most important <laughs> scarce resource on the planet. Uh, people fighting for pasta in supermarkets and being a little bit in an elbow mentality uh, 
me first. I think many people did that, and at least the more social one of us said, my family first, let's protect them first, because we didn't know what was coming. Also, the member states of the European Union behaved in this human way. Not a positive human way, but they behaved as well as that. Think about Germany and France in the first two weeks blocking the exports of masks. Probably politically totally understandable because when you don't know how many masks you have for your own citizens who elect you, uh, should you really allow that they're carried across the border uh, to our friends in Austria? No, you, you take care of your own people first because they elect you. But it was not nice to see that. Huh? Uh, and uh, the European Commission had to intervene and to unblock this. After two weeks, it was unblocked. Now, this part of the story is never told. Huh? But nevertheless, uh, uh, it was not nice initial behavior. Even worse, when Italy, the country in the European Union, hit first by the pandemic, not because the Italian health system is not good or the Italians were behaving in a negligent way. No, because they were the only country in the European Union, together with France and the United Kingdom, that had direct flights to Wuhan from where the virus originated at the time. So when Italy saw what was happening, all the people coming to hospitals and in intensive care, uh, they didn't have enough ventilators, huh? you know, ventilators that you need for getting oxygen. Uh, and uh, they asked, they activated a mechanism that we have in the European Union, the civil protection mechanism, which is there where you can ask the other member states, can you please help me uh, in a case of need uh, with resources that you have and uh, I don't have. And they didn't give a single response from the other 26 member states because everybody said, well, ventilators? I don't have enough ventilators myself. Huh? If there are 100, 200 people uh, on my intensive care station, then we have not enough ventilators, so we will not send them now to Italy because my own citizens will kill me politically if I deliver them now to Italy. But this was, again, not a nice behavior. Everybody looked after themselves, human beings, families, and, of course, also nation states, and not only in Europe. Everywhere in the world they did that. Borders were closed, yes. Uh, and for us as Europeans who are used to free travel, this was particularly painful. But borders were closed everywhere in the world. Uh, travel was interrupted. In Australia, you couldn't go from one state to the other. In the United States of America, there were uh, blockages between the members of uh, the, the Federation uh, states of the United States of America. So everybody protected themselves and went back to smaller entities. Huh? They didn't go back to, we are a global community, we all help each other in the first week. Everybody went back to where they were thought they were safe, huh? where they thought they can control it. And in most cases, this was the nation state. Huh? Because the nation state is, and even for the strongest Europeans among us, we have to uh, accept that, the nation state is the last resort in such a situation when uh, we are faced with death or even worse situations and public order is at stake. So there was a lot of egoism, there was even vaccine and mask nationalism, there was competition, and not only in a positive way, there was rivalry. Some even tested the idea of buying Sputnik to annoy the others, some even bought Sputnik. So it was a, a, a strange situation. But there was perhaps also something positive in this. Because huh? I'm not one of these people who sees everything negative. Even though I'm one and a half years in Vienna, I still have not lost my optimism, huh? which is uh, something. Huh? Because in Vienna, you have, first of all, to say everything is bad. But I still see something good in, in, in this. I, I think it was good that member states were the first line of defense in the first weeks. Because they saw that they are in charge, that they are responsible. They had to decide whether to close schools or to open schools. They couldn't return to anybody else. This you cannot decide in Brussels. Sometimes the question if Vienna can do this for Upper Austria, that is already the question. But that I have learned in Austria, that this is not so easy. We have also seen, and I would say, we have seen something that is new for me as human nature. We got much more interested in how the others are doing. Haven't you realized this? Are you also not one of these people who are every morning on the world and data and see how, how are the Japanese doing, how are the Americans doing, how are the British doing, how are, those Japan, uh, how are the Indians doing? There's almost an interest. It's, it's like, 
and I think it's positive. Huh? We want to learn from each other. We want to see how are we, how are we placed in this fight. And people understand this is a global race, so there is some commonality. People look beyond borders, huh? uh, and they did this from the very first days. Is perhaps the Swedish solution the better one? Oh, no, it's not such a good one. Huh? Let's not do, follow the Swedish way. Uh, are the Austrians doing it better than the Germans? This is an eternal competition, and I will not answer it tonight, huh? because then I would be thrown out of the, the building. Uh, but but it's, it was interesting to see how quickly and how until today, every day, the world has got also, at the beginning, it got more apart in this pandemic, but it got also closer, because we started to get much more interest about this we understood that this is a pandemic. It affects everybody in the world, and therefore we also wanted to learn. We wanted to pick up eagerly solutions that perhaps somebody else had. So I would say there was also something positive in the first days of the pandemic. I come to lesson number two. This is already more positive, so I will not uh, frustrate you the whole evening. Don't worry about that. Um, I think we have seen in the European Union something that I haven't seen in previous crises, but that I have seen in this crisis. In previous crises, think about the financial crisis. You refer to this. Huh? Think about the migration crisis. There we had a situation where it took a long time until the first common solutions were found and agreed. And it was very, very nasty between our member states. It is still nasty when you look at migration. We haven't the solution yet. Huh? So there was a lot of divisiveness, but the fight against each other, ideological positions. And I think the reason was that in both the financial crisis and in the migration crisis, not all countries of the European Union were affected in the same way. Some were in the first line, financial crisis, Greece, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Portugal. And some were looking there and saying, does this really concern me? Let's be honest. If you lived in Austria, the financial crisis was something you saw basically on television. It was not something that affected your own personal well-being. You were worried, perhaps, that my taxpayer's money ends up somewhere in the south. Let's be frank, that was some people were worried. But it was not something that affected the well-being of people in Austria or Germany or France. The migration crisis, almost already a bit different, but still the, the, the countries that were most in the first line of defense were the countries who are, uh, have an external border. And that was mainly Greece, and that was mainly Italy, a bit of Spain perhaps a bit Hungary as well. But uh, for the other countries, it became an issue a bit later, but they were not affected in the same way, let's be honest. This crisis was different because it was a symmetric crisis. This crisis affected each and every country of the European Union, of the world. Perhaps some two weeks earlier and some two weeks later, but at the end, everybody. Those who thought at the beginning, ah, this is a problem for the Asians or a problem for the South in Europe. No, quickly they saw this affects all of us. And that is something good about this crisis, because it was a symmetric crisis, it affected all of us. Therefore, it was much quicker that in the European Union we started to find common solutions. Because we didn't lose a lot of time by saying this is the fault of the South or of the North, of the West, or of the East. Well, we all were affected, we had to act. Huh? And while in the first weeks, the nation state was in Europe dominant, because this was the only known factor in such an existential crisis, very quickly, and I'm still surprised because I've seen how long it took in the financial crisis. Bernhard was there as well. In the financial crisis, it took us at the end five years until we had really common solutions. And one can debate whether we're the right ones, but it took a long time. And not that the commission didn't have solutions. The commission had them already on the weekend of the 9th of May 2010. But until all member states accepted it, uh, and was long and complicated, intergovernmental and so on, uh, it took a long time and cost a lot of money and a lot of suffering. This time, already in March, April last year, you remember the pandemic was declared by the World Health uh, Organization as a pandemic in March last year. In March last year, in the same month, the European Union took its first actions. The first thing what the European Union did, all 27 member states, to put an economic and financial safety net under all our member states, companies and employees. F 540 billion euros were mobilized to make sure that this pandemic, which was clear it would have a devastating economic effect because we had to freeze the economy, so we needed a lot of public money that had to go into it. So we needed a safety net that this didn't turn into another financial crisis. And within days, our finance ministers, and you know how finance ministers are, they never are very generous with money. This time, 
Within a couple of weeks, there was an agreement at the level of the Eurogroup and then of the heads of state and government to say we have this financial safety net of 540 billion for states, for companies, and also for, um, also for employees, eh, which was a remarkable thing. For the first time, we mobilized common money for the whole European Union that everybody had. What we know here in Austria is the system to support, uh, uh, um, um, uh, to, to support employees who are temporarily uh, redundant, eh? but they are continue to be paid at least a large part of their, uh, of their salary by the state or by an insurance, eh? Kurzarbeitergeld. Eh? And this is something that most countries except Germany and Austria didn't have, and we invested, we issued common bonds to finance that, the so-called sure system, and uh, financed this in all member states. 19 member states could finance short-term assistance to their uh, underemployed uh, workers because of the pandemic, uh, thanks to the European Union. Therefore, we didn't have a huge unemployment crisis this time, contrary to the financial crisis. Huh? In the European Union, Unemployment went up from 8.7% to 9.1% at the maximum of, uh, of this crisis uh, in, in 2020. In the United States of America, it went up from 3% to 9%. So a jump by 6%. In Europe, it was not even 1%. Uh, that was because we have a social safety net that was now supported by the European Union by solidarity. So very quickly, solidarity was there. Solidarity was also coming from another EU institution, probably the one that is normally acting uh, the fastest because this is a truly federal institution, the European Central Bank. Already in March, uh, ECB President uh, Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank, announced a new program, which has the wonderful name PEP. I like it. When a program to fight a pandemic is called PEP, uh, this is like Pep Guardiola, so this is, a, this is a good thing. It's fast, it's, it's targeted, and it scores. And exactly that what this program, this pandemic emergency purchase, purchase program did. Immediately, from one day to the other, the ECB decides 750 billion euro will be bought in the bond markets, sovereign and corporate bonds, to support the sovereign states in the European Union that they can give out all the money to support the economy, to record employers. Where did the money come from? Huh? Have you never wondered in the first weeks of the crisis? We don't wonder where the money comes from. We go to the cash machine and money comes out. But normally in such a crisis, where the whole, whole world is frozen, there's no money that comes out of the cash machine. Even in the financial crisis in 2010, there were weeks um, immediately after the fall of Lehman Brothers, where you could, even in Austria or in Germany, go to a cash machine and nothing came out anymore because the global system of money was disturbed. Not this time. Because our common central bank stood behind the states, stood behind our currency within weeks. And you all may remember in the financial crisis, it took three years until we were in such a situation. This time much faster because of the drama of this crisis, of its deadly nature, but also of the fact that it affected all 27 member states symmetrically, and therefore there was much quicker the will to act together jointly. And then came an additional element that probably most people would not have expected that the European Union would ever do this. We also understood that after the pandemic was over, we need a common effort to build up the economy again. President Macron compared the pandemic to a warlike situation. You heard many times words like, we need a Marshall Plan. A Marshall Plan is when you have to reconstruct something. And thanks to uh, French President Macron and the German Chancellor Merkel in May uh, last year, there was the proposal to have this time, in this crisis, differently to the previous crisis, a joint recovery fund funded commonly by the European Union, by bonds issued by the European Commission on behalf of the 27 member states. And even more surprisingly, a couple of weeks later, in July, all 27 member states agreed to this. Huh? I always find it surprising because 750 billion euro was exactly the money we needed in 2010. On a weekend in May, when the markets opened on Monday, we knew either Greece is bankrupt, and with them many others, or we need to mobilize 750 billion. And on a Saturday at the time, the Commission made a proposal. Uh, we call it in the Commission the Clemens Ladenburger proposal, but uh, uh, according to a very eminent lawyer in the Commission, uh, which basically looked like the recovery fund that Merkel and Macron now invented. So 
It's never invented by the heads of state and government. It's always invented by brilliant lawyers in the commission, but that's our secret. Huh? And because there's also something important. We never need the copyright. We need to get things done. And I think that was very important that this, this was made, that was, this proposal was made, and that for the first time, we don't look only to resolve the crisis, but we look beyond, and we now finance the recovery now the money is being issued in these days. It's arriving in Austria as we speak on the accounts of the Austrian government, it's arriving on the Luxembourgish government, on the Portuguese government. This common money that uh, our Austrian finance commissioner, Johannes Hahn, has organized on the financial market uh, to finance the recovery, and not only to finance the recovery, but to direct the money into the direction of a green and digital recovery of the European Union. It's focused, it's not money to be spent like that. It's for the first time that all countries in the European Union in a recovery after a crisis try to go into the same direction in a synchronized, convergent manner. Because it's common money, so we can also direct it much more than in the past. And the fourth element of solidarity that happened in this crisis, and I'm still surprised that it happened, all 27 member states agreed to jointly purchase vaccines. And they agreed to do this at a moment when there was no vaccine yet available. And I remember when we spoke to experts in the commission, in the member states, most people told us it will take three or four or five years until we have common vaccines. Normally it takes five years to develop them, another five years to produce them. This is the norm. Huh? But they agreed to do this last year in the summer. They tasked the commission to purchase, uh, or at least to order the vaccine. And the commission who had no experience with that, because the commission is not in charge of public health of the member states. No? The commission has, uh, in our Directorate General for Health, we have around 700 people working there. Of these 700 people, most work on animal health. Because the last crisis that happened was the BSE crisis, that was the mad cow disease, some of you remember that, and then we established these people to have, have safety here. But to look after vaccination is something that I think we had, nobody in the commission had ever done this. So all the expertise had to be organized in a, in a very few weeks. Together with all member states, there was a committee where all member states were represented, and there was a lot of exchange of experience in this committee, and at the end, uh, we purchased successfully uh, uh, five successful vaccines, uh, we had a big portfolio of different vaccines because one didn't know which one would be the best, and we, put, we didn't put all eggs in one basket, but we bought several baskets, so, as you would do in such a situation when you don't know. And yes, it didn't work very perfectly at the beginning, uh, as it didn't work everywhere perfectly. Nobody can say it was perfect, but today in July, July, August 2021, less than one year after this decision to jointly purchase vaccines, Let's see, how is it here in this room? Who got vaccinated twice here in this room? Wow. Seminar room one and two, who got vaccinated twice? Okay, that's a bit less, but still impressive. Who got vaccinated, who hasn't said now yes, who got vaccinated at least once? So it will happen very soon, the other one, huh? the second shot. But isn't that impressive? Huh? And I think this is a very young audience here, 70% are now vaccinated, or at least vaccinated once. We are now better than the United States of America. The problem is, that's, I come to lesson number three, our citizens don't know that. Europe was amazingly successful, even so successful that we should have almost a bad conscience. 70% are vaccinated in the European Union now. How many are vaccinated in the whole world? Anybody has an idea? A percentage of the world population? How many are vaccinated twice in the world population? Any idea? We 70%, what do you think? Guesses? Five or 10? Five or 10, yeah, it's a bit better. In the whole world, we have now 15% as of today, so it's a bit better. Uh, but the whole world includes also the United States of America. Uh, uh, we're also now, uh, a couple of weeks after, 70% are vaccinated. Um, in, in, uh, in Africa, only 2% are vaccinated. So I always say that to some, we say, but it went so slow in Europe. I say, well, perhaps you're a bit more respectful to the rest of the world because we are the richest continent. We organized it not knowing very well how to do it. Nobody knew how to do it extremely well. We have 70% now vaccinated. The United States of America together with us as well. Nobody else in the world has this. In Japan, 
30 to 35 percent. That's why there's the Olympic uh, Games without audience. Huh? Um, so let's not complain. Huh? Sometimes we should say uh, we are perhaps a bit better than we think. But, but why do the citizens not, not, not know about that? And I read in no newspaper at the moment, success, 70 percent vaccinated. Why is that? Well, I think I have three answers to that. Answer number one, I think it's perhaps our nature as Europeans. We are not so American. Huh? An American, if they do something well, even though it's not fully well, they always say we are the best. Huh? The Europeans feel, we perhaps feel a bit ashamed to say that. Huh? Perhaps because in the history, we knew too many people on our continent who said we are the best, and we afterwards found out they were not so good for our continent. Huh? Perhaps this self-critical way is also healthy. But it sometimes leads us to go into the other extreme, from self-glorification to masochism. And we always say we are the worst, we are total disaster. Have you counted the number of times that the word total disaster was used in European newspapers by politicians in Europe, including in Austria, in the past uh, six months? I can't count it anymore. Huh? It's so often. If this was a total disaster, we, sh we should be all dead. Huh? Then it would be a total disaster. But we are alive and kicking and sitting here together now uh, and even enjoying academic reflection. So there's something strange with us Europeans. Huh? I think there's something else. We have a problem with risk, we Europeans. We don't do something when it's not 100% safe. We, our, because it's such a luxury in which we live, such a safety. Everything is perfect. Huh? If you go into a supermarket and something doesn't work perfectly well, have you heard the shouting, notably in Vienna? My goodness, huh? as if, 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 if the Third World War is breaking out. Huh? Um, there was an interesting uh, experience with the so-called green passport. Have you heard about this? You have it, perhaps some of you have it now, we, we call it now EU COVID certificate on your, on your smartphone. It was first done in Israel. And everybody said, well, the Israelis are doing great. In Israel, they started to do it when it was available on 30% of the smartphones of the population. And they said, it's here, it's a success. It, was only, it was, didn't work on iPhones. It worked only on Samsung phones, even though most people had iPhones. But the Israelis introduced it and said, well, better we introduce it on the 30%. It works there. Uh, but we, and then we, we introduced it a month or two months later on the iPhones. Unthinkable in Europe. If we had done it, two-thirds of the population would have killed the politicians. Huh? It works there, and this guy has, a, has an iPhone or a smartphone of this nature and can now travel, and I can't. Unthinkable. Huh? But in other parts of the world, and that's why we are so perfectionist, we Europeans, and sometimes we stand in our own way, we cannot start with something and then do the rest. No, it has to be 100%. And if you have to get it 100% right, it takes longer. Hmm? Uh, I like our perfectionism, but sometimes in such a crisis, perhaps we should be one step less perfectionist. That's my personal view. And then the third reason. Now, a third reason is... I think that has to do with the structure of the European Union. Now I become a little bit legal. When you are outside Europe and you learn about the European Union, you think the European Union is a federation. It sounds like a federation. There's an executive, a legislature, there are laws, there's the primacy of EU law over national law, so this sounds like a federation. We even call many of our bodies like federal institutions. The European Central Bank works together with the national central banks in the European Union's euro area, and we call it euro system. Why do we call it euro system? Because the United States of America calls their central banking system the Federal Reserve System. We call ours the euro system to say it's federal. In this case, it's also relatively comparable, not 100%, but almost comparable. In health, we had pandemics in the past, even not so long ago. Huh? We had a pandemic with H1N1. Anybody remembers it? The swine flu? The swine flu was a pandemic, was declared as a pandemic. And in Asia, it was very, very dangerous. And in Europe, it could have been very dangerous. At the time when we saw that a pandemic can happen, there was a proposal from the Commission to all health ministers of the member states. Look, the United States of America, it's a federation, we're not, but they have a great instrument to fight a pandemic, the so-called CDC. If you have seen the movie Contagion, you have heard about it, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Great guys, huh? come in these white things when the trouble, uh, uh, like the military. They have 10,000 members of staff. 
They have a budget that is bigger than that of the city of Vienna. They can really fight a pandemic. And in a crisis, they have the right to act. They're a federal authority. A federal authority in the US means a central authority. They can go in every town in the United States of America, isolate everybody, close the school. They have full powers in such a situation. So we thought in the European Union, let's also have something like that. After it came out of the discussion with 27 member states, we had something that was called the ECDC. That's how we Europeans are. We put an E before and things. Now we have the same thing. But the member states gave it only 200 members of staff and a budget that was uh, even lower than that of the summer university of the University of Vienna. <laughs> and that means a lot. Huh? I hope I, I say the right thing here. <laughs> One always has to say the right thing in, in front of uh, people who may give more money in the future. So, so what we have done, we give in Europe the impression sometimes that we can act like a federation. We even give it names that are federations. But we are totally under-federalized. We are under-federalized. And this leads to disappointments, because then people say, why in the crisis is the European Union not, action, not acting? What has this body there in Stockholm done, this ECDC? Well, if you speak to them, they couldn't do anything. They didn't even have the power to get data from the member states. They were on Google checking from where do the flights come. This was their working method, because they didn't have any right to get data from the national health ministries. Now, of course, after this crisis, the Commission makes a proposal to step up the budget and the staff, and now everybody says, initially, a great idea. Let's see how it will be next year at this time when uh, the finance ministers will look at this again. It will also not this time become a full CDC, I'm very sure. We need probably two crises for this. So Europe has a problem that we are structurally under-federalized in key areas because our member states are reluctant to share sovereignty and sometimes need, unfortunately, a crisis to go a step further. And I come to my fourth reasons why our citizens don't know and are disappointed. In my view, not in a justified way. The reason is we Europeans, and notably those in charge, are, and not now I use the word disaster deliberately, a disaster in communication. All of us, everybody in this room included. The European Union is the only club in the world that I know if you say it's a club with 27 member states, where the 27 members of the board of this club permanently say negative things about their own club. This is the European Union. Because the 27 board members are the 27 heads of state and government who sit in the national capitals. Brussels is not governed by Brussels, except when it's the Belgian government, but by the 27 national, national governments. They are in charge, notably in the crisis. So. But they have a great tendency, because democracy works, unfortunately, like that, and media work like that. They Europeanize failures and nationalize successes. And someone who was the best in class in this discipline was called David Cameron. You see where this led us. But everybody has this in themselves. And we saw it in this crisis. When something didn't work well, it was Brussels, even though you yourself sat at the table. In every member state, everywhere it happens like that. And that lesson out of this part has to change. Lesson number four, and I'm always approaching the end because I'm interested in all your question and remark. Lesson number four that we see in this crisis, more than in previous crises, Europe is very much alone in the world. I think we haven't realized this so much than ever before. In the financial crisis, after a couple of days, it was also a global crisis, the international community led by the United States of America put things together in the framework of the G20, organized a global recovery effort, a global effort to stabilize the financial system. And so at the end, uh, there was global cooperation in many respects at its best, uh, even though uh, it, it didn't always work perfectly. But at least everybody was working together to solve this crisis because the global financial system was at stake. Not this time. Not in this crisis. This crisis probably started in China, and I personally believe if China had been more transparent, more open at an early stage of this pandemic, had informed the public, had allowed its doctors, its scientists to speak, journalists to report what was happening in Wuhan, we could have stopped this pandemic much earlier, as we did with SARS, for example. But this time, this didn't happen. 
If the United States of America had been in 2020 an active player of the global multilateral system, we could have stopped or at least reduced this crisis much earlier. But the only, but it was Mr. Trump, you all remember him, huh? this was the guy with the orange hair. But the only body that did something for international cooperation was the European Union. I remember when the first call was there, before we even had a vaccine, that not only the rich countries should be vaccinated, but the whole world. Vaccine should be a global common good. It was the Commission, the European Commission, that called an international conference and founded with private, public, and international actors uh, the COVAX initiative. The Americans were not even present. The Russians sent somebody very inferior to this and given, didn't give a cent, and the Chinese sent, I think, the ambassador there. So it was a, a Europe-led initiative to have solidarity in this crisis at a time where Europe didn't have a single vaccine. No? Also, we don't speak about that enough. No? When it was then, when we had a vaccine, what did the Americans, now under Biden, what did the United Kingdom do? They had an America or United Kingdom first policy at that moment in time. They didn't allow, by which way ever, no? will not go into the legal details of that, but the fact is that almost no vaccines left the United Kingdom or the United States of America in the first six months of this year. While in the European Union, even though that was politically not easy, we allowed every vaccine that was produced here to be transported to Canada, to transport it uh, to the rest of the world, to Japan or wherever, because many vaccines were produced in Europe. Uh, this is also something most people don't realize, that the European Union has become the pharmacy of the world in this stage. Yeah? We don't speak enough about this, but this is a fact. We have exported almost as many vaccines to the rest of the world than we have vaccinated in the European Union. No other continent has done that. Canada got its vaccines from the European Union because they were cut off the supply from the uh, United States of America, even though you all will agree geographically they would have been a bit closer. Huh? So Europe is very alone, and Europe has to do a lot on its own shoulders and is perhaps not yet ready for this. We had to grow up during this crisis. Huh? We had also seen that there was vaccine nationalism, vaccine diplomacy outside. Huh? We suddenly see that in our neighborhood in Serbia, planes land with the Russian flag, the Chinese flag, and say how great we are, and look, the European Union is a disaster. Their own politicians say that every day. Huh? How can we? When we are successful, allow others to have a propaganda victory, because just we are bad in communicating. Even one of our member states participated in this shameful exercise. Huh? So, the European Union has to learn to grow up, to stand up for its interests, but also say what we're doing. Huh? We are the pharmacy of the world. We are the largest donor of development uh, aid in the world. 55% of all development aid in the world comes from the European Union. How often do you hear this figure? I almost hear it never, because people are too shy. So let's be less shy and let's speak more about that. Huh? And I come to lesson number five, the final one. You all know that on the 9th of May, this year, a conference is started, the Conference on the Future of Europe, huh? which is there, initially was there to say what do we do after the European Parliament elections 2019, namely in institutional terms at European Union level to strengthen democracy, efficiency, and so on. Now the conference has started, this reform conference has started right after the pandemic. And therefore, the issue that is at the center of this uh, conference, where citizens all around Europe are invited to participate and participate as well, is to say, how do we continue after this pandemic? What are the lessons that we draw from that? The Commission has published some reflections on this uh, in the health field, but it goes much broader. Here in Austria is probably the country which is participating most actively in this debate. Uh, the government is very interested in that and is very active in launching this debate. There is talk about a reset of the European Union, even about a new treaty for the European Union to put it on new, more solid foundations. And as a lawyer, I'm always, I love such ideas, huh? because I know a new treaty means I can write three more legal commentaries, and it takes uh, 10 more years until everybody understands what they say. Uh, and I love new treaties, huh? because it's a great thing. However, in this case, I think we should not jump too quickly to conclusions. In my view, what we have seen in this crisis was not so much do the laws work well, do the institutions work well. 
no institutional framework can work perfectly in such an unprecedented global crisis. And none has worked perfectly. Huh? Neither the Chinese one, nor the US one, nor the British one, nor the Israeli one. It has worked nowhere perfectly because everything had to be adapted, everything had to be invented. So let's not draw a conclusion from that. I think what was decisive in this crisis is there was at the relevant moment the common will to come to common solutions and then to carry them through. Common political will, common human will, is in my view what is most often lacking when we have problems in the European Union and in the world, and is most of the time the better solution than institutional settings. Our institutional setting is not bad that we have in the European Union, and I don't think we will get quickly a better one. Therefore, I think we have to work inside. So if we look at the immediate challenges we have now in the coming weeks and months, will there be a fourth wave or not? because of the Delta variant, well, we have at some point to say, how do we organize the third doses of vaccinations everywhere in the European Union? I'm saying that here because otherwise in three months' time, say nobody from the Commission told us that we should be prepared for that. So, no, we should be prepared for that, and the Commission is prepared for that, but we cannot vaccinate people. That has to be done by national authorities. Uh, they are in charge, but we can say this has to happen now. And the good news is we as Commission have ordered enough vaccines. At the moment, we are swimming in vaccines in the European Union. So therefore, this is a big difference to the first phase of the crisis. Um, another challenge for the next weeks and months is the economic recovery. I think it looks not bad at the moment, huh? but we need to maintain that in all sectors of the economy. And some sectors of the economy will have to adapt and change. Huh? Look in every restaurant. Have you realized something here in Austria? There's a lack of people to serve. Some people have found other jobs in this time. They found out it's a rather stressful job to work in a restaurant. No? They have gone somewhere else. No? I think we have to think about pay in such, such uh, fields and about the social dimension of that. Climate is a big challenge for the next weeks. There, I don't need to have new rules in institutional terms. No? It's qualified majority, anyhow, already at European Union level. There is no unanimity. No? Those people who say, also in Austria, very often unanimity is the problem. It's not. The policy areas where we have the biggest problem, they are already under qualified majority. Migration, for example, is under qualified majority. But the common will is not yet there. So let's rather work in the common will than on institutional castles in the cloud, is my view. And probably the biggest challenge of the next months and probably years is our common values and the rule of law in the European Union. We have seen in this crisis, and I personally was grateful to live in this crisis, in this deadly crisis on this continent, where it was not a disaster, where politicians elected democratically have carefully balanced the threat and my rights. And this has happened every day. Sometimes it went a bit too far in this direction, sometimes a bit too far in this direction. Yes, you can argue about that. But I would say all politicians, regardless whether from the left or from the right, from the center or whatever, everybody has tried, whether health minister, finance minister, everyone has tried to balance this huh? under the watchful eyes of journalists, of our democratic citizens, uh, and of the institutional fabric with courts and so on. Sometimes courts have struck down a decision, sometimes not. But overall, I felt overall the balance is right huh? between restrictions and freedoms, because restrictions, there had to be. Freedoms had to be preserved when, when possible again. And I think overall, even though I may individually, not everybody may agree with every single decision, overall the balance was right. Huh? It was different in China, drastic solutions. Everybody's locked up for, for a couple of weeks. Huh? Okay, that's also a possible solution. It's very efficient, but it's not possible in a democracy. And it's also not possible, like we had it in parts of the United States of America when Trump was still governing the United States of America, say, just go out, uh, kiss each other, and uh, if, if necessary, uh, drink a uh, strange... Uh, 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 a strange politour. So that was certainly not the continent where I want to live. Now, I think it's the right continent where we live, but we have a problem that in some of our member states and in our neighborhood, uh, the rule of law is under attack. And this is not a small issue. This is a big issue. Why is it a big issue? Not because I'm a lawyer. A lawyer is a big issue, of course. Huh? But it's a big issue because the European Union is the first example in the history of our continent of a community of nations that is brought together not by the force of the strongest, but by the strength of the law. We are a rule of law community, a community under the rule of law, a union under the rule of law. And that has worked for 70 years. 
We settle our disputes at the end by judgments of the European Court of Justice. And it is a miracle that in 70 years of the European process, all member states have at the end, whether they like these judgments or not, whether they have fought against them in the previous instances, always accepted them. Now, for the first time, we see a threat to the fact if judgments of the Court of Justice are respected and implemented. We have judges who make a preliminary reference to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. What national judges have to do, this is the only way to bring a court uh, issue, uh, at a national court, an issue to the European level and get a European interpretation of a matter that is settled in our treaties or in our Charter of Fundamental Rights. There are now disciplinary measures threatened against such judges. Well, this goes too far. Huh? The Court of Justice has recently said this undermines the trust that is needed between member states in a community governed by the rule of law. And therefore, this is not a small issue. It's an issue where, again, I come back to the first lesson. Yes, in some cases, we are thrown back to the member states. And in this one, we are thrown back to our member states because the European Commission can do only one thing when a judgment of the Court of Justice is not respected and implemented. We can ask for a second judgment that imposes then a fine on the respective member state. But when this fine is due and not paid, we have no European executor who can go to Vaso and get the money. That's the end of the matter. So, at least for the EU institution. Here, it falls back to the 27 member states or the other 26 to say, do we really want to work in a European Union where judgments of the Court of Justice are not respected? Do we really want our citizens to tra travel freely across Europe and be not sure that their rights are protected in the same way, that they're not being discriminated against in all member states of the European Union? Do we really want our companies to invest on this side or that side of the border, but not being protected against arbitrary decisions which are against European Union law? Because that could be the ultimate consequence if the rule of law in our member states is undermined, because the courts in the European Union, that's different to the United States of America, the Union courts are the national courts. They are our, the union courts, the courts of our union are the national courts. We have nothing else. We have no central courts in our member states as we have uh, federal courts operating in California next to the Californian courts. We don't have that in the European Union. European law depends on the execution implementation by the national courts in our member states. Therefore, this matter is so important. And here again, I'm a bit grateful that the beginning of this pandemic has shown how important the member states are. Also, they felt important. I hope they feel as important on the rule of law because this is an issue on which the future of the European Union depends much more than whether we win against the Delta variant. Because against the Delta variant, we will win. But the rule of law must win, otherwise there is no European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, I have exhausted your pa patience far, uh, far enough now. Thank you very much for your interest. I hope uh, uh, you have some questions. I'm looking forward for a stimulating debate moderated by my friend uh, Bernhard, who hopefully will not have fundamentally disagreed with most of the things that I have said. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and wish you uh, a very good evening. Thank you very much.